I'd like to invite you to just enjoy the experience that we're about to encounter. I'd like to introduce to you a man of a very humble beginning, a man that was able to overcome the horrific misclassification of special education. A caring man, a man that will encourage you because he's been there and done that. And I'd like to encourage you to keep an open mind and be empowered to change your life. I'd like to present to you a man of men, Richard Butley. Richard Butley. Welcome to Did You Know podcast, your host, Richard Utley, dedicated to the African-American viewers. The program is aimed to celebrate African-American culture and deal with the real and relevant topics that impact the everyday lives of the African-American community through frank and insightful dialogue with local and national influencers. Every day, there is another horrible, discouraging news story directly or indirectly impacting African Americans. But we need to look at the shining stars in the galaxy of Black America. It is time to test our story. Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another Did You Know? Thank you for joining me this evening. As you all know, I start out with certain things that I think I'm very concerned about. And I keep telling you, I'm going to keep bringing certain things up till we get the message. Killing, killing, killing. Dying, dying, dying. We got to stop it. But we have to take responsibility in our own community. And we can't have anybody else take the responsibility. So I'm going to keep bringing that up because we're all responsible. And we need to do everything we can to stop the violence. We just have to. I keep telling you, you keep waiting on somebody to ride into your neighborhood and correct all the ills. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to take the responsibility. I told you before, audience, it's our responsibility to help correct the violence, help to correct the attitude that a lot of people have of our, of our neighborhood. That's why I have this program, because I feel it's necessary for us to define who we are and tell the story about who we are, because we have to be the ones to paint the picture. And I just get sick and tired when I think people stop me in the street and say, why are y'all killing yourselves? Like we want to kill ourselves. Well, why do you let that happen? Why do you let drugs come in your community? Why do you let guns come in your community? And sometimes I say, uh, oh yeah, we, we manufactured them guns ourselves. Okay. Oh yes, we created all that. We've had help and we've allowed it in our community, but we have to step up and stop allowing gun violence. We're going to have to tell people that we will not tolerate that. The other thing is, I hope that everybody keeps about elections. I keep telling you, we got to elect people who's going to be for us. If they're not going to be for us, then we need to vote them out. We have to start holding politicians accountable. Accountable. And I will keep preaching that. Accountable. We have to let people know that we will reward those who support us and we will punish those who will not, which means that we will vote them out of office. I notice a good day because after all now, we finally have a African-American woman that will be on the Supreme Court. And we should be very proud of that. Even though we saw how she got treated, but she persevered and she made it through. And that's the important thing. But I hope also that you keep in mind how she was treated. And the way she was treated was not kind. So we need to make sure that when we have people running for office and they say certain things, we need to do that. We have to have a memory 
like everybody else has. So that's really what I want to talk about earlier, because this is a special program for me tonight. And I say it's a special program for me tonight because I'm going to have the opportunity. And when I say the opportunity to bring someone on this evening that is related to me. They are my first cousin. My father and her father were brothers. But I'm bringing her on because I told you before, I believe in that we have to tell our story. And I want people to tell their stories so that you can relate to their stories. So then maybe that may change your life or maybe make you want to do some of the things they want to do. That's why I had Chris Franklin on because I brought Chris on because he is the metal arc lemon of the Harlem Globetrotters. But how did he get there? He had to work to get there. He had to practice at night. He had to do certain things. So I bring different people on so that you can see how they got to where they got to. And at the same time, sometimes as I bring these people on, I know this for a fact because I get stopped in the street. I read uh, text messages and I see all these kinds of things. They say, oh, I was going through that too or I, I was going through this. So sometimes you're able to relate to it. So tonight I should be happy, I should be exciting because I have my first cousin, Reverend Jackie Utley on, and I'm gonna have her talk about her faith journey. But before she does that, I'm gonna have her tell you who she is. Reverend Good evening. Good evening. First of all, good evening, Cousin Richard. It is such a blessing to see you and to be seen by you. Happy to be here this evening. I am the Reverend Jackie Utley, and I am the pastor of the Ascension Lutheran Church in Columbia, South Carolina, where I have served here for the past nine years. Okay, could you tell us um, who you are, where you grew up, and how you Maneuver to okay. wait. All right. So you want to see how I got here? Yes. Okay. Well, well. For, first of all, you yourself may recall being family. How my father was of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. My mother was of the Apostolic faith. And while they were both zealous in their own rights and their own faith, I participated in both faith traditions. I was raised in, in both faith traditions, having a uh, grandfather, my father's father, who was Baptist, who was a Baptist uh, minister, the, uh, religion was in my blood, so to speak. However, having been raised that way, I did get away from church uh, as a young adult and then later returned to church by way of Church of God in Christ, so, which is Kojic. And once I got involved with that particular church in my adult years, um, I became a uh, a licensed evangelist in the Church of God in Christ. Church of God in Christ does not practice the ordination of women um, for pastors. And for some reason, I got a call from God to go to seminary for a Master of Divinity degree uh, somewhere around 2005. And when I did, I ended up in a Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary here in Columbia, South Carolina, where I did obtain my Master of Divinity degree in 2009. And then in 2009, I met a Lutheran pastor who later became the bishop of the Lutheran church here in South Carolina. And he told me he knew that God had sent me to that Lutheran seminary to become a part of the Lutheran church. And so you yourself, Richard, was part of this history making because in 2011, in 2013, after I had joined the Lutheran Church, I was ordained as the first African, African American to be ordained in the Lutheran Church in the entire state of South Carolina. That took place in 2011, and you yourself attended that ordination service. You recall that? That is very true. I was very proud of you. I mean, I want people to think about this. She was the first in South Carolina. Yes. Can you repeat the year again? It was 2013. 2013 was the year. 
And you were willing to be a trailblazer. Yes. 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 I was. And then after that, the idea was is that in the Lutheran faith tradition, pastors are not appointed, they're not assigned by a presiding elder or a bishop. You apply for the position at a church, at a congregation, and they will interview you and vote for you. If they do not want you, they do not vote for you, and you will not be their pastor. But if they decide that you are the one who God sent to them, which the people at Ascension apparently believe that, they voted for me to be their pastor after having served here at the church with them for two years with their current pastor. They got to know me. And once they got to know me, when that pastor resigned in 2013, this congregation of Ascension Lutheran Church called me to be the first female and first African-American to be the pastor of this church. How do you balance that out with, um, with the Pentecostal, with the AME, with the Baptists? No. And yeah. How do you yeah. handle all that? Because you're a mixture of all. That's exactly what I am. I always jokingly tell people that I am a spiritual much, a spiritual mongrel, so to speak, for the fact that I may be mixed, but I'm not mixed up. I know who I am in Christ. I know that we serve one God. And so if we're all serving one God, no matter what the faith tradition is, it's all uh, what your relationship is with that one God in which we serve. And so with that being said, having received a theological education, uh, when I acquired my Master's of Divinity degree, it gave me pretty much wisdom and insight on how to be, as Paul would say, be, when in Rome, be as the Romans, how to be among people and be with them and be who they are. And so I'm able to balance it out that I knew that I could not come into a Lutheran setting, especially with people of the Caucasian race. And I come from a black church and come into their church and present the, the word of God or the gospel to them in the same manner that I would in, in a Pentecostal or a Kojic church. So therefore I would need to use wisdom in how to proclaim the word of God to the congregation that God sent me, sent me to be a pastor of. And so uh, I would say that just having wisdom is how I balance out, you know, being all of those things and then being who I am as a Lutheran pastor. Um, let me ask you this other question. So you say wisdom and you had to balance it out. So when you balanced it out, I'm just going to ask some questions. When you balanced it out, I guess you had to balance out the interpretation, the service itself. Uh, I, I, I'm just saying this. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm just saying this. Sometimes we know that some churches are an hour, some churches are two hours, some churches are three hours. It's a mixture. Right. So, how were you, so how were you able to navigate that? So here's the thing. We, we, the idea is, is uh, I always tell people it's Christ church, but we can't help it. We might as well be real. In this world in which we live, um, we have what we call black church and we have what we call white church. It's a known fact that black churches may run anywhere from two to two and a half hours with the type of services that we have. In the Lutheran church, as well as some of the, uh, as well as Episcopal and uh, United Methodist, they're structured, their liturgy, every church has a liturgy, but their liturgy is so structured that for the most part, it's scripted to a certain degree, where they have in their bulletin, point A, from point A to point B, what the service will be. And the service usually uh, lasts one hour in the Lutheran church, in Episcopal churches, you know, and such. And so, and because of that, there's a certain liturgy that we use in every service. And in our Lutheran church, we actually have communion, Holy Communion, every Sunday. And the service still lasts about an hour. And so it's a matter of what I always tell Pentecostal preachers from the Black church and some of the Baptist churches is that because we're so prone to use a manuscript, you, you use a manuscript to proclaim the word of God and, you, and that manuscript helps you to gauge your time, to gauge yourself. Where if I was in the church of God in Christ, if I, were, if I don't use a manuscript, I'm just going to preach from the top of my head, whatever the spirit says, and I may preach. 25, 30, 40 minutes, you see, just 
off the top of my head or the spirit led. But you can still be led by the spirit with the manuscript. But however, as I said, that manuscript will gauge your time. Whereas a sermon might be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, 20 at the most. And with the sermon lasting that amount of time with all the other prayers and readings and hymns that are part of the service, service lasts anywhere from an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And um, that's how I, that's how I manage to be in the setting that I'm in. Um, you grew up in a very small town, um, yes. Lakeview, South Carolina. Yes. How did you, when did you, even though you have a mixture, as you said, you are a pedigree of, of all of them, because as you, as you said, uh, yes. all of your family, for the most part, was very religious, and your grandfather. Yes. Uh, even mm -hmm. his grandfather as well. Yes. Um, what made you decide that you want to take on what you're taking on now? Because you're doing many things. Okay. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you, I, and I'm just going to be real. The idea is I've come to the conclusion that uh, I was a very dedicated, uh, I would say dedicated church for. I am a Christian. I am a believer in Christ, but I was one who was in church every Sunday when I committed to being in church. I was committed wholeheartedly and I'd be in church every Sunday. And when I joined Church of God in Christ, for the most part uh, of a Pentecostal faith tradition, uh, services was, would last anywhere from two and a half to three hours long. And I would sit in those services and they would be spirit filled and spirit led. But I sat and the more I, I attended these type of services, I myself, personally for me, began to realize that some things were being said and done in those types of services that took up a lot of time and that held people in church for too long. And I myself grew weary of that. And I said, something's got to give here because it doesn't take all this time to get to, you know, to get to the point, to get, you know, uh, even spirit led. And so I myself grew weary of sitting in churches for three and three and a half hours when it was a whole lot that could have been eliminated. I must say this to you too. Uh, when it comes to uh, the LGBTQ community and those churches, I had gotten tired of hearing hate messages that were preached to people of the LGBTQ community. Whatever the Bible, whatever scripture says about people from that community, I don't believe a, a preacher should stand in the pulpit and preach hate messages to people uh, you know, of that, of that sexual orientation. And I was hearing a lot of that hate messages. And I made up my mind that I could leave um, churches like that, that I'm not going to just waste time attending church, whether it's in my family tradition or what, if I was going to hear those types of messages and, and be held in church for three and three and a half hours. So that's this bottom line, how I branched away I, you know, branched away and, and was spirit led into this, into this faith that I'm in. Um, I'm going to ask you, a, I guess this is somewhat of a, a personal question because it's based on knowledge from me. Now, okay. you do have siblings that are still belong to the Pentecostal and they are ministers and bishops. Yes, all of them. So mm -hmm. how have you been able to balance that with them in conversation wise? Oh, spirit, because of the because of the Holy Spirit, we're all of there's one spirit. And oh no, well, let me just tell you, because there's two types of spirits. There's a spirit of error and there's a spirit of truth. And if we're all operating under that spirit of truth, it does not matter the denomination. But when I was first called to this Lutheran church, I turned it down for two years. When the bishop called me and said, We want you to come to the Lutheran church and be a, a minister and become a pastor. I turned it down for two years, did not want to come and prayed about it. But every one of my siblings from the apostolic holiness faith said they believed it was God. They all looked and said, we don't think it was by accident that, that you ended up at a Lutheran seminary as an apostolic at, uh, African Methodist Episcopal child. It was God's doing. And they supported me wholeheartedly that this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. So I have their full support. And we just love Jesus together, you know, because I can feel they come and visit me at this church. 
and then I can go back to our churches that I come from and praise God and you know and just give God glory just like just like before. So it's just a matter of balancing it out and being true to who you are and being led by the Spirit, cousin. That's what it all boils down to. What do, you, what do you mean by be true? What do you what do you mean by that? Being true. When I say being true, like for instance, I might as well just say to you, I am a Lutheran pastor. I am of the Lutheran faith. So there are certain uh, uh, truths that are, are tenets of the of the Lutheran faith that I have taken on and believe. Whereas when I was a uh, Methodist or practicing Pentecostal may not have been that case, just like we believe, I come from a believer's baptism where a person confesses Christ as their Savior and then they're baptized. Where the Lutheran faith is what's called infant baptism. They believe, they teach that you baptize a baby and then you raise the child. The parents or the guardians raise that child to believe in Jesus Christ and at a certain age, then that child will, will confess Christ as their Savior or get confirmed into the faith. And so for I struggled with that in the beginning. Once I used to struggle with sprinkle baptism versus submersion. And then I sprinkled with infant baptism versus believer's baptism. But the Holy Spirit through prayer and discernment, God showed me that it did not matter about the, 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 the way the baptism occurs. Water is water, whether it's sprinkled or whether it's submersion. And it does not matter when the person is baptized, whether they're baptized as a baby are baptized as an adult, but the idea is that there must be a conversion that takes place in the heart of every individual. And that, you know, that's the way it works for me. And that's the way I teach it. That's the way I teach the faith. That's being true, true to who you are. Okay. Um, we're gonna go back to that, but you're doing some other things too, because you carry your, 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 your church out into the community. So yes. you're doing some things out there. So could you share with my audience some of the other things that you're doing? They don't realize okay. that a, a pastor has a role of many things. And oh, they yes. things to many people. So could yes. you tell us how you navigate that, please? Absolutely. Because for one thing, my bishop, when I first became the pastor here at this church in Columbia, because I'm not a... Uh, I, I was born, you know, in the PD region of South Carolina, and I didn't know anything about Columbia, and nobody knew me, and I didn't know anybody really here. So as a uh, newcomer to the city, uh, serving as a pastor, it was my bishop's idea that I joined the local Rotary Club uh, that existed here uh, in the city, uh, in the community, in the neighborhood that I was residing in. So I joined the the, 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 the neighborhood Rotary Club and got to know many pastors that were part of that Rotary Club. And so I made ties and bonded with people there. And so that was one avenue of where I even served as president for one year's term. So I got to know people. I got to navigate and know people through that organization. Then in the meantime, I become a part of the South Carolina Christian Action Council, became a member of the Interfaith Partners of South Carolina, where 18 uh, religions are part of Buddhists, Muslims, you know, Hindus, you name it. And we are like, you know, we like friends. And so we bond together in that sense. But of recent, here five years ago, I became involved with something called the Justice Ministry. And here in Columbia, South Carolina, it's called More Justice. It's the Midlands Order Organized um, religions of, of the faith tradition here in Columbia and of equity. And so what it is, it means that as pastors, the Bible says in the Hebrew scriptures, Micah 6 and 8, oh mortal, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And so someone introduced to me that there's a big difference between doing mercy and doing justice. And so it's a mandate of God that we do justice. And I thought the mercy acts that I was doing was doing justice work. Like we, we feed the hungry and we clothe the poor and we, we go to schools in the afternoon and read in programs and stuff. Those are acts of mercy, not justice. And so when I became a part of this more justice ministry, 
I learned that the actuality of that particular ministry was that we would hold the public officials accountable for the ills and the wrongs of, that were happening in the community. So we addressed community problems by bringing the mayor, the chief of police, or uh, uh, city council officials and different ones. We, we meet with them and hold them accountable for bringing about the change that's necessary to better the lives of the people in our city. I'm wholeheartedly involved in this and just became this year a co-president of the More Justice um, Ministry. And just to let you know, because it's so effective, uh, just uh, two weeks ago, we held something called the Nehemiah Action, where we had over 600 people gathered due to the pandemic. Uh, we had 600 people gathered and we had the mayor attend, the mayor of Columbia, South Carolina attend. And we had uh, county council members of the city and county, county council officials attend. And we brought them on stage before all of their constituents and asked them questions of would they be, uh, would they um, support an affordable housing trust so that people will have decent places to live or, or be able to, you know, afford, have affordable rent and what have you. And gun violence, as bad as gun violence is all over the city and Columbia is infested with crime and gun violence. We even are going to, we had the mayor agree to work with us to bring in a prop, a, a evidence based problem analysis that will combat gun violence. So this is the work that we do in this justice ministry. And I'm really excited. As you can tell, I'm really excited about it. And I think that I think that's I think that's important. I mean, you're a Rotarian. I'm I'm a Rotarian as well. As one of the things that you said that I think that's very important is yes. that everybody has to get involved. The yes. community has to be linked. And we yes. can't link it just us, but we have to bring everybody in so everybody can understand what we're doing. That's why I have a program is because I want people to understand who we are. And so instead of having people define who we are, I feel we define who we are. And once Absolutely. we define, when we sit at the table, yes. we sit at the table equal. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's I think that's yes. important. Yeah. And and what's so good about like this justice ministry that we're in, but for the most part, it consists of it's a faith-based organization. It's nonpartisan. You know, uh, you know, we're 501c3, it's, it's, it's faith-based, and we have over 35, up to 35 congregations from uh, every faith tradition, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Muslim, uh, Roman Catholic, and even from the synagogue. Okay, so we have rabbis a part of it, imams. And we're all working together to do this justice, to do this justice ministry. So it's biracial and everything. It's diversity, diversity and race and all. Yep. I, I mean, I think these things are important, and that's why I bring people on like you, so you can maybe plant a seed here. Somebody can plant a seed, or see what other, see what other, see what other people are doing. Because yes. sometimes they define us, and they don't necessarily define us correctly. Right, absolutely. Uh, let me ask you another question. The fact yeah. um, people always have this image of communities, north, south. You know, they say, oh, the northerns are like this, southerns yeah. are like this. Yeah. But at the same time, you're able to, as a, as a pastor, to blend all that together because you have people that come mm -hmm. to your congregation from all over. And something yeah. I'd like you just to, to talk on it because when you became in your congregation, and I'm very clear about this, your congregation were basically because all neighborhoods change, and yeah. a lot of times churches that were once all white now yeah. are mixed or, yeah. or, yeah. or so how were you able to navigate that with your with your congregation? Well, see, first of all, as it turns out, the neighborhood that the church is located in just happens to be the same neighborhood where the Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary is. My church is right behind that seminary. That seminary is considered a white institution as all the Lutherans in South Carolina were white 
and all of the professors and teachers and everybody at that institution were all white, but it was this white institution that was sitting right smack dab middle of a predominantly black neighborhood. Well, as it turns out, in 1970, I'm told, white flight took place. And when it did, all of the, when the whites left, their church remained here. And so what they did, they may have left the community, but they come back to their church, to be at, at their church. And so this so-called to blacks in this community would say that white church this Lutheran church that the average African American doesn't even understand and know what a Lutheran is and could care less about what a Lutheran is. It turns out that these whites that were still attending this church, though they do not live here in the community, when they come to this church, they become a part of this community and they became elderly. They became very elderly. Children moved off, went to school, got married, and all of the congregants ended up being what, let's say 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. So the church is dying out. The bishop came up with the plan that in order for this white institution called the church, Lutheran church, not to die out in that neighborhood, where they, with, which is predominantly black, it was the bishop's idea that bringing a black pastor to the church might make a difference. And, and of course it did. So when I became the pastor here, and got and and being a people person that I am, and got out in the neighborhood and began to be, become known. And I'd go from door to door, knocking on doors, letting people know I'm here in this community. I serve at this church, and they'll say that's a white church, and and I say no, not if I'm there. It ain't a white church, you know, because I'm the pastor of the church, so it can't be a white church if I'm the pastor of the church. And so therefore, let the person know that. Well, if you're there, perhaps I'm. I can come there. And so therefore, uh, they, they began to visit. Now, here's the thing. The average Black person in the community already, if they're into church, they already got a church. They're already in a church, you see, a member of a church. And then the idea is if a person isn't in church, then they don't really do church. And so I don't force people. I don't be after chasing people. Come visit. Come to our church. I'm just here. And I make myself known in the community. Here's a trick, too, that happened. It's a setup by God. I know that this, this whole uh, journey that I'm on is a setup by God. I say ordained and set up by God. It just so happens that before I got here, the, 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 the former pastor let the neighborhood association use the fellowship hall in this church for their monthly meetings. Okay? And so that means everybody who lives here in the neighborhood, black, white, or whatever, they come to this particular church in the fellowship hall for a monthly meeting, like second Tuesday of every month at six o'clock in the evening. And so these people come in and we attend the meeting and now they see, oh, you the pastor of this church? Yes, I am. And I introduce myself to people and I don't hound them over. Won't you come visit us this Sunday? My thing is lots of times you don't even have to say it. The spirit will lead, some, will lead people to a church, you see. And so I don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, big people come visit us or whatever, but because they get to know me and see my spirit and see who I am, it just so happens that we now have several people, you know, people of color, Asian people. I have an Asian neighbor who lives across the street from the church. He's a devout Roman Catholic, and yet, and they don't usually commune with with other people, you know, outside of the Catholic faith. This man comes to this church and communes with us every other Sunday. That's God. And then there, it just so happens, what is it that, uh, is it regentrification? What is it when a neighborhood starts to right, change? Right. You, you know what I'm talking about. Regentrification, well, right. Yeah, well, okay. How about what once was a predominantly black neighborhood because the houses sold uh, for less, you know, because of the type of neighborhood it was, who bought the houses but white? Now they've come back into the neighborhood, you see. And so as they come back in, they see this church here. They see this black pastor with this predominantly white congregation. And so people will come out of curiosity just to see. And then when they come, some of them get hooked, you know, in, on our church when they, when they come and visit. So that's one way I always say that. That's so, how mm -hmm. okay. So let me ask you another question. Um, 
how do you look at spirituality? How do you look at that and how do you interpret that for, for, for people? In general. Well, see, first of all, I look at spirituality. I tell people that going to church does not make you uh, a Christian. That attending that church does not score brownie points with God. You can come every Sunday, but if that heart isn't right, if that heart does not have, if you don't have the heart of Christ, the heart of God, and love, the love of God. You, you know what I'm saying? If that's remember when you asked me earlier about being true. See, the idea is, is that if a person is in Christ, they will love. They will have love. And then they can show love. And so where the Bible scripture says, with love and kindness have I drawn thee, that's the only way you can even draw anybody into a faith community is through having love and showing love. You see, so I look at the spirituality as in you can stay at home. Okay, you're home, you're homebound. You can't get out. You can't come to church. That not coming to church does not make you a heathen or does not make any person, any other person more of a Christian than you are. Because I try to tell people, it's not, it's not the coming and attending church that makes you right with God. You can be at home and, and, and not be able to go to church. Now, here's the thing, what I do say now, if you are able, to go to church. I don't believe in long range of Christianity. I don't believe you just stay at home and watch all the televangelists on TV and be a faithful Christian. No, it's the assembling of yourself together with others that we hold one another accountable. Because I said a person, a long range of Christian can stay home. You know, you ask me about spirituality. There are folks out there that think I can just stay home and read my Bible and pray and look at the TV, televangelists on TV. And I'm just as much Christian as those that go to church on Sunday. Okay, doesn't work that way. You see what I'm saying? You can stay at home. You're not around other people. And you think you're fine. You think you're just on fire for the Lord and, you're, and right with God. But it's the assembling with others that we hold each other accountable. Because people rub you. We, we, we don't like everybody. And guess what I preach from the pulpit? You don't have to like everybody, but you must love them. You see, people need to know that there's a difference between like and love. You see, because there's some people I don't like. I don't like their ways. But I love them with the love of God. And surely I'll pray for them. And if need be, if I see where there's a way that I can help them. And don't even like them. But I can love them and be a helper to them. For I am my brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. So spirituality is all about a heart conversion and your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why I always say the world is, well, you know, there's an old saying that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And I say that, yes, it is. If people don't turn their hearts toward God, I, that's just who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I stand on. That a person's heart must be drawn to God to serve God. What I would like to do, um, I'm going to have somebody else join us to this program. Okay. And that's Reverend Thomas, who is the one that got me to be a part of this program. And I want to bring him on and I want him to have some dialogue with you as well. Okay. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Reverend Jackie, we are just so fired up uh, just listening to your witness and your love for the Lord and your labor of towards the people of God. Again, it's refreshing. It's inspiring. Uh, one, one of my first questions would be, how have you processed the criticism and rejection of many that believe that women shouldn't be a part of, uh, you know, the clergy as far as, you know, being a pastor or being a minister or carrying the word of God? How have you uh, responded to that criticism and to that negativity, man? Funny, funny that you would ask that question. So, I guess it's just my personality is who I am that for some reason, I know that the opposition is there and I know that people think that way. But for the most part, when they meet me out of respect, they don't go there. I don't hear it from them. So I don't get to combat them with it, though I know the thought may be there. Yes, One of the things that I, I kind of struggle with, but I just brush it off, is that uh, I know who I am in God. First of all, I myself did not believe that God called women to oh. pastor. And oh. see, people don't know the difference between a pastor and a preacher or a minister. Yes, 
See, they don't understand that, God, that their offices, their calling. And see, when God called me to be a pastor, whether I can even preach good or anything, the idea is a pastor is one who loves the people, who cares and shepherds the people. And some people can be a preacher, but not be a pastor. And people don't understand that there's a difference. But see, because I know the difference, and I do know that God had to make, make, had to make a believer out of me that I'll show you that I call women to be pastor. You know why? Because I'm going to make you one. I'm going to call you to be one. And God made a believer out of me. With that being said, I know who I am in God. I yeah. know who I, who I am in Christ. And it's just one of those things that the Holy Spirit let me know that don't take it personal. That people think the way they think. They can't help that they think the way they think. I know that there's some people that may not even be in opposition to a female pastor or clergy, but the idea is, is just by nature, this is what I go through all the time. And you'll be able to uh, confer with me that I'm telling the truth for the most part. When people find out that I am a reverend and see, and I'm ordained, and I never cared about the title. I don't care about titles anyway. I'm, I'm a sister in Christ. I'm a child of God. But I have received ordination papers by license. I am a Reverend Jackie Utley. When people meet me, and, and I'm introduced as Reverend Jackie Utley, pastor of a church, first off, they'll say, oh, okay, uh, and they know that I am. So then when they refer to me again, guess what they call me? Miss Jackie or Miss Utley. And I know that people don't call male pastors Mr. So-and-so. When a man is introduced as a minister or pastor or reverend, they will be called that by whoever's talking to them. Young, old, male, female, black or white. But guess what I experienced? And God has put me in a place where I can laugh at. And the Holy Spirit says, don't take it personal, you see. And it happens all the time. And I know that there are people that care for me and they respect me as a pastor. But for some reason, they can't fix their mouth to say Reverend Jackie or Reverend Utley. They'll look at me and say, I can't call you Jackie. So what should I I'll call you Miss Jackie? I hate Miss Jackie. I'd rather be called Jackie, if not even Reverend, than to say Miss Jackie if you think you're doing me a favor by putting a handle in the front of my name. So that's I'm often dealing with the fact that um, that people I know that they can't help how they think because I was one. I too used to think God didn't call women to pastor churches, but I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does because God calls me. That's powerful. One more, and I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Utley uh, uh, get back in here, and I'll ask another one after Ben here should time permit and allow. Uh, how has the uh, pandemic uh, impacted? Uh, the way that you do ministry, uh, you know, at your home church there? It's, it's awesome. Glad you asked. It, it's just one of those things. It's just phenomenal for the fact that back in 2020, whenever they said, well, okay, let's close the churches down as two and say to have our services. Uh, the youngest people in my church are in their mid 60s. Okay. I have nothing but seniors. I don't have any teenagers. I don't have any children, and it's just us old folks, us seniors, okay? And so here that age group was the what? The most crucial age group, you know, sensitive age group that you must be careful. We stopped having services two months, two and a half months in 2020 when the pandemic hit. In April and May, by June, the oldest member of my church 100 years old, called me and said, Pastor, <laughs> sure. if we are willing to come back to our church, would you be willing to open the door? And I said, by the grace of God, if you come, I'm here because you're still paying me. They were paying me to be the pastor without yeah. coming to church, you know, for those two and a half months. And when he called and asked me that, he said, we're small. We don't, we, we average anywhere from 15 to 25 people on a Sunday because it's all elderly. It's a dying out church. But God has been sustaining us for the past nine, 10 years that I've been here. Those elderly people asked, if you will open the doors of the church, 
we want to come. We'll wear our masks, we'll take temperatures, and we'll social distance. And we have been having church from June 2020 up until today. So it's like we never lost, we never missed a beat. And that's God's doing. Everybody's been safe. Nobody contracted the virus. We're all vaccinated and we're just having church every Sunday that's in awesome. person. Isn't awesome. that awesome? Yeah. Look what the Lord has done. Go ahead. The Lord is doing and it's marvelous in us. Yes. Thank you for asking that because we're worshiping every Sunday. And here's the other thing. Claire. The elderly, they don't do Facebook. They don't do streaming. They don't do any of that technological stuff. So there was no other way for them to be ministered to. See, I was sending them a uh, weekly uh, a lesson, you know, or a little sermonette uh, when we weren't having to. But they missed the assembling of themselves together because they didn't want to do a conference line. They wouldn't do Zoom because they don't have computers. They're elderly. So this is why God said, well, I'll bring you back together in person while everybody else is Zooming and, and, and streaming and FaceTiming and all of that. We're in person, we're in person. Wow, well said, well, well said. Go ahead, Ms. Gia. Um, I guess the other question is, um, what is your thought process when I hear that religion is, is not as prevalent as it was when we were growing up? I mean, there's no question when we were growing up, there was a foundation. Yes. Especially yes. in the black community, there was a foundation. That's right. That's right. The foundation is not there huh. anymore. So how do you navigate it to get people to understand the importance of religion? Well, see, the idea is, is you, you, you said something earlier that would address that for the fact that there's religion and then there's spirituality, okay? And so that's the whole thing about it, that religion is what it is, religion, but spirituality is that relationship, that relational aspect of someone having a, 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 a drawing or yearning to be in relationship with a higher power with who we address as God, you see? And so people can be religious and not have a relationship with God. You see what I mean? And so we know that because uh, children are, 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 are birthing children and raising children, uh, single uh, uh, parents and different ones and young raising children, they're not going to church. The children aren't required to go to church. And so church is just, you know, is it, it, not important. And so religion and church are tied together for people. And I run into people that say, I believe in religion, but I don't believe in those organized institutions. I don't believe in organized institutions. And if I wasn't a pastor, I wouldn't believe in them either because of what's going on in a lot of them and how people are in a lot of, in a lot of the churches. You, you understand what I'm saying? So what I always let people know is that no church is perfect, nobody's perfect, and religion definitely is not perfect. You see, but I always talk to people about the spirituality of a person, you see. So if nobody ever goes to church, it's not that they can't get to know God and have a heart for God, um, just out of the heart yearning for a spiritual, a spiritual um, bond with God. So how, how do you see spirituality um, becoming more of a norm? Well, the idea is, well, first of all, I remember one time when I used to say, all I can do is pray for folks and the Holy Spirit let me know. So don't say all you can do. Say the most you can do is pray for people. See, and that's our job. Pastors, people of God who are called by God. We have to pray for the world. We have to pray for this country. We have to pray for this nation. We have to pray for our city. We have to pray for people you know, as a whole, that God, because God is able to touch the heart and reach the mind of any individual. There's no person, there's no, no, no criminal, no, no, no bandit, no nobody that's too hard or that's unreachable by God. And so my prayer is that God, who can do all things and do anything but fail, that God 
is able to turn the heart of people back to God. And see, the idea is, is that when, when those of us who, who are carrying the mantle will walk the walk and talk the talk, be true to who we are, people in the street, people who are not spiritual, they can be drawn to you, to, your, to, uh, to a person who is, uh, you know, uh, in with God. They can be drawn to your spirit. I have had people say that, that there's something about you. You're different from the others. I've been turned off by some of those other preachers, but there's something about you. I'm not the only one. I'm not just, I'm not lifting up myself per se, but there are those of us who are called and who are true to the call that people that the, uh, 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 are crook on the corner can see you coming and see that and see that you're for real and you can draw them through love. So whereas the Bible says, through loving kindness have I drawn thee, we who are called of God can draw others into the body of Christ, into a faith. And they may never, there are some that are never going to put their feet in a church. They're not even going to cross the threshold of a church. But guess what, cousin? Broadcast, like what you're doing. Zoom, streaming, and everything. There are some people tuning in. And so thank God for technology. Look at this. The God, God is so awesome. God said, let me throw you a little technology and let me let you look at each other and talk without being in person. And so because this gift of technology, of this gift, there are people that are going to come to know God that will never, ever step foot in a church. And, 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 and see, there are some people that will say, well, you're a pastor, you ought to want people to come into church. There are some people just not going to ever come to church. But it doesn't mean that they won't get to know, know God and, and, and develop a relationship with God. And, I, and it's all due to technology. And um, people of God having a spirit of love that will draw others to Christ. That's what it all boils down to. I'm enjoying this and time be moving fast, but uh, we're not over. But I would like for you to take some time and share with my audience what you feel that you want to sh share with them for a few minutes. Okay. Well, what I would want to share to the audience is I don't know what your background is. I don't know uh, what your financial situation is, what your marital situation is. Um, and some people think that love, that uh, happiness comes from having a lot of money and perhaps having a love, having a love. And I'm here to tell you that God, just having a relationship, with God. Uh, let me just say this. There are some people who dress better. There are some people who eat better. But there are some people that because they know God, they sleep better. I'm one of those people that just by having a, a, a personal relationship with God, I'm able to sleep better. And the rest falls in place. The money the love relationship, whatever, but put God first in all that you do and all these other, and my mother used to always say, seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. Those things which are good for you, those things which you need, but seek God and put God first in your life. Okay. That's my uh, Reverend Thomas. Praise the Lord again. Uh, you are authentic. I don't know. If, I'm sure you probably heard the term real recognizes real. <laughs> but Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Thomas. Real today and in a world of deception and lies and deceit, it's, it's always a, a blessing yeah. uh, to run across someone else that's in this for the outcome, not for the yeah. income. Absolutely. Not to build bigger buildings, but to build bigger people. So again, we applaud you. Uh, we're, we're celebrating with uh, Richard uh, for God putting us all together, using technology for such a time as this. Real quick in closing, uh, you said you had the opportunity uh, during uh, during Passover uh, season that just uh, ended a, a few days ago to yeah. uh, preach one of the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Why yeah. don't you hear just a little bit about that word and uh, uh, how that impacts our generation and society today in closing, ma'am. Thank you and God bless you. Okay. 
Well, see, what it is when I looked at it, I said, when Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was dying on the cross and he said, it is finished, he was not saying for us that it was over because it was the, the, the beginning of new life. Because the Son of God had come, had been sent to this earth to walk and live in a body of flesh and suffer and die in order that the world might be saved. And so that mission had come to an end, but it didn't mean that Jesus was finished because in his dying, we receive new life. We receive salvation. And so it is finished does not mean that Jesus is finished and that it's over for us. And there is always an opportunity that because Christ lives, because I believe in the resurrection, that because Christ lives, lives within us, lives within our heart, that's the only hope for this world in which we live, is that we will let Christ come and live, accept Christ in our hearts and let Christ live in our hearts. It is finished does not mean that it is over for the people of God. Um, I, I think it's uh, um, important before we close that I just want the audience to realize families are made up of many people, many situations, and many beliefs. And I think it's important for us to reach out to each other, especially as family members. And we, yeah. all, we all take different roles in how our lives are going to be. I yeah. mean, you know, you're into the ministry. Uh, you know, I'm I'm talking politics all the time and I got my mm -hmm. podcast. And so I'm trying to influence people and things in, in, in my way. And, right. and, I, and, and realizing that uh, the importance is that, and I think this is very important, we respect one another. And I think, yes. I think that I think that I think that's very important because one yes. thing that I can say is that my family will say what they think and what they believe. Absolutely. Good, good bad, good, bad, or indifferent. Right. But, but, you know, something that, as you said earlier, because we all, like I said, we all came up un under the foundation. I'm sure some people who, who know me and know me for a long time are probably watching this program saying, whoa, I didn't know uh, Richard had a first cousin or didn't even <laughs> probably didn't even know that my grandfather uh, was, was, was a Baptist minister. Yeah. Probably people don't know that. Um, right. I think that one thing I would like for you to do is I'm going to do it a little different. I would like for you to say a prayer to close out this program. Yeah. Okay. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, creator of us all, loving God, God of justice and mercy. We thank you for this opportunity. We don't take it for granted that you allowed it to be so because we know that it is not by chance or circumstance. I believe it is of your divine will that we have had this time together this evening. And to all those who may be listening, help them to know that they are not listening by accident but by your divine will. And so God, I pray that you stretch out your hand and touch hearts and minds of your people all over, all over the world. And I fail not to mention our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, that war-torn country of Ukraine, oh God, that you were bringing in to the war. Comfort those people as they are, are, are looking for places of safety, oh God. And then even here back in our part of the country, oh God, continue to heal this land, oh God. You said if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves, pray, and turn from their wicked ways and seek your faith, that you would heal this land. Help us, oh God, to turn. Help us, oh God, to seek your faith. Help us, oh God, to pray all of your creation, that your holy will will be done. I thank you for my cousin having me as a guest to speak this evening, oh God. And I just thank you for the work that you're doing through, through his podcast, that you'll continue to bless his work, oh God. 
in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that your holy will will be done in our lives. We thank you right now in advance for what you're going to do, what you're doing even now, for what you've already done. Let your holy will be done in our lives. And these things we pray in your most holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And I hope, audience, that you got something out of this. As I said before, I was going to bring people on to tell their journey because I think it's important that we tell our stories our way. So thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next. I'll see you the first Tuesday of next month. So have a good evening and thank you for tuning in. God bless. God bless my cousin. Thank you for joining the Richard Utley Show on The Voice 17104. We will be here on The Voice 17104 every first and third Tuesday from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Once again, thanks for viewing. Remember to visit us on Facebook and reach us and we welcome your questions and or comments. Oh,